The National Desk, America's News, now. Developing now, the Federal Reserve's fight against inflation costing you more. You are getting this double whammy of rising prices and rising interest rates. For the fifth time this year, the Fed raising interest rates. And we anticipate that ongoing increases will be appropriate. A look at the impact it will have on your wallet and what comes next. Tensions reaching a boiling point over migrants being bussed and flown all over the country. GOP-led border towns at odds with Democratic-run cities. Somebody came from out of state, preyed upon these people, lured them with promises of, of a better life. This was about using human beings uh, as part of a, a, a political stunt. But others say it's about time issues at the border were recognized. We finally have those Democrat mayors finally saying we do have a crisis. Where more migrants are now being sent as the number of border encounters reaches record highs. Plus, more trouble for Trump. The former president and his children hit with a massive lawsuit accused of defrauding the state of New York. Claiming you have money that you do not have does not amount to the art of the deal. It's the art of the steal. How the Trump team is responding and why some say it's just another political hit job. This is the National Desk, America's News Now. I'm Eugene Ramirez. On this weekend edition, we take a look at the big headlines of the week and a look ahead at what to expect. We start with the four big stories we've been following for you all week. The Federal Reserve raising interest rates for the third consecutive time as it tries to fight inflation. The border battle intensifying as Republican governors continue to send migrants by bus or plane to Democratic-led cities. Former President Donald Trump and three of his children accused of defrauding the state of New York in a $250 million lawsuit. And President Biden's controversial comments in an interview claiming that the COVID pandemic is now over. But first, more on the Federal Reserve's move to tame rising prices. The Fed raising interest rates by 75 basis points after a worse than expected inflation report this month. The National Desk Atra Elnishar has more on what it means for a potential recession. For the fifth time this year, the Federal Reserve raising interest rates. And we anticipate that ongoing increases will be appropriate. The goal is to create headwinds for the inflationary pressures causing prices to soar at the fastest rate in decades. Signs already the economy is slowing. In August, existing home sales dropped for the seventh month in a row, according to the National Association of Realtors. But prices are still rising. The median existing home price is still 7.7% higher than a year ago. Inventory is still expected to remain tight. NAR chief economist Lawrence Young explains, quote, some homeowners are unwilling to trade up or trade down after locking in historically low mortgage rates in recent years, increasing the need for more new home construction to boost supply. You are getting this double whammy of rising prices and rising interest rates. Wealth advisor Michael Wagner says credit card bills, car payments, and other new or unfixed debt are also immediately subject to the interest rate hikes. I really would recommend that if people are able to, we call it deleveraging, you really want to start paying down these loans. Economists point out it takes longer, perhaps 6 to 12 months, for the full impact of the rate hikes to be felt throughout the economy, part of why it's so difficult for the Fed to calculate the risks and outcomes of their actions. Well, Mr. Diamond. J.P. Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon, who earlier this year warned of economic storm clouds, tells lawmakers on Capitol Hill he's reluctant to forecast whether the Fed can lower inflation without triggering a recession. I think there's a chance, not a big chance, a small chance of a soft landing. There's a chance of a mild re recession, a chance of a harder recession. Food and energy prices remain unpredictable. On Wednesday, U.S. gas prices ended a nearly 100-day streak of decline. Americans bracing their wallets for what comes next, including more expensive debt. In Washington, I'm Atrel Nishar for the National Desk, America's News Now. Now, as inflation pushes up the cost of food and utilities, more Americans are racking up credit card debt. According to a new report from CreditCards.com, 60% of cardholders have been carrying balances for at least a year. 
That's up 10% from 2021. Now, back in June, Americans owing 200 and, I'm sorry, $887 billion in credit card debt, an increase of roughly 13% from the same time last year. Economists saying that is the largest increase in credit card debt that we've seen in more than two decades. And even though Americans are feeling the pinch of inflation and interest rate hikes, polling shows people's outlook on their personal finances is improving. A recent New York Times Siena poll on personal finances resulted in more people ranking their personal financial situation as excellent or good, up 2 and 5 percent respectively from July. Fewer viewed their finances as only fair or poor, those down 4 and 2 percent respectively. Now the other big story we are following for you, the battle over the border. The migrants flown to Martha's Vineyard by Florida Governor Ron DeSantis have now filed a class action lawsuit in federal court against the Florida governor and other Florida officials. The lawsuit alleges that Governor DeSantis and his accomplices engaged in a quote premeditated, fraudulent and illegal scheme centered on exploiting the migrants for the sole purpose of advancing their own personal financial and political interests. A sheriff's office in Texas also launching an investigation for those same reasons. The sheriff there says the migrants were lured for political purposes, lied to and recruited for the flights. This as a sobering milestone was reached at the southern border this week. Customs and Border Protection officers arresting their two millionth migrant a record for a single year. Politicians now proposing new tactics to force Washington into action and debating new ideas on how to handle those with uncertain futures already here in the United States. The National Desk Chief Political Correspondent Scott Thuman reports. A record-breaking crush of immigrants at the border and carrying over elsewhere from D.C. to Martha's Vineyard to New York. We open up 23 emergency shelters. Are we going to find creative ways to solve this man-made humanitarian crisis? Maybe, he says, even housing them on cruise ships. The Republican governors responsible for sending them to those cities argue it's hard for New York, for example, to complain of 13,000 newcomers in a city of more than 8 million people. A Texas sheriff is now investigating if Republican governors broke any laws by sending them north. Those migrants were being treated horribly by Biden. They were hungry, homeless. They had no, no opportunity at all. The state of Florida, it was volunteer, offered transport to sanctuary jurisdictions. We're now giving some Democrat-run states and cities just a tiny, tiny taste of what border communities have been enduring literally for years. All sides in this argument agree that action is well overdue here in Washington and point to a failure by Congress to come up with a comprehensive solution. The politics often playing out more readily than legislation. What I would really like to see happen is I would like to see the feds create an immigration policy that people can understand and people can enforce and people can abide by. We don't have that. Down the hill, the White House, too, has struggled for years with the fine line of caring for people just seeking a better life versus securing a border and enforcing the law. We will try to do more to speed the deportation of illegal aliens who are arrested for crimes, to better identify illegal aliens. We are a nation of immigrants, but we are also a nation of laws. Decades of discussion still short on resolution. In Washington, Scott Thuman for the National Desk. Former President Donald Trump, his three eldest children and his business are facing a fraud lawsuit filed by New York Attorney General Letitia James. The National Desk Kayla Gaskins digging into the steep penalties that Attorney General is seeking in the suit. Essentially, Letitia James aims to lock the Trump family out of the New York business world and get them to pay $250 million in penalties. New York Attorney General Letitia James filing a sweeping lawsuit against the former president on Wednesday. Claiming you have money that you do not have does not amount to the art of the deal. It's the art of the steal. The 220-page filing, the result of a three-year investigation. The document alleging Trump had a pattern of inflating the value of assets to obtain favorable loan agreements, citing 200 instances of alleged fraud over 10 years, like Trump's Fifth Avenue apartment, for example, which he allegedly reported was 30,000 square feet when it's actually 11,000. The exaggeration bumping up the value to 327 million. To this date, no apartment in New York City has ever sold for close to that amount. Trump's three eldest children also included in the suit, along with his company. 
James seeking to bar all from doing any business in New York State. Donald Trump Jr. firing back on Twitter, accusing James of weaponizing her office to go after political opponents. Donald Trump taking to Truth Social, posting, quote, another witch hunt by a racist attorney general. Please sue him for us. Oh, we're going to definitely sue him. Adding montages of James on the campaign trail, promising to take Trump down. It should also uh, be noted that uh, Trump tried to take the offensive and use this by filing a suit um, saying she's prejudiced to take this case away from her, and that flopped. He filed that suit last winter, and later in the spring, a judge threw it out and said, uh, no, you, uh, that uh, is not a good enough argument. The former president is reacting to the lawsuit. Trump telling Fox News this about Letitia James. She's trying to defend banks that got paid off. She's trying to defend banks that had unbelievable legal talent. I will tell you that. They're very good. Although this lawsuit is only a civil case, Attorney General Letitia James sent documents to the federal prosecutor in New York, encouraging them to take up a criminal case. I'm Kayla Gaskins reporting. The Justice Department resuming its review of about 100 secret documents recovered from former President Trump's Mar-a-Lago home this week. A federal appeals court lifting the hold, barring them from those records. Now, the DOJ was denied access to those documents while a court-appointed special master reviewed the files, searching for anything that might, might be protected by attorney-client privilege or executive privilege. That special master, who was requested by the Trump team, now asking for proof of former President Trump's claims that he declassified the sensitive documents found at Mar-a-Lago. Trump's lawyers have not offered any proof, but in an interview this week, the former president saying there's no specific process for declassification, that presidents can simply make that decision directly. Right now, mortgage loan rates are above 6% nationwide. It's the highest they've been since 2008. I'm back with our fact check team now. Connor, give us the facts here. What did the numbers look like a year ago? Well, we looked at Freddie Mac as our source and found that those rates averaged just 2.8% last year. And earlier this summer, they were just over 5%. And now the Fed is expected to raise interest rates by uh, three quarters of a percent. What impact will that have, if any? Well, when the Fed hikes those interest rates, it has more of a direct impact on credit cards and auto loans. Those typically go up with it. But its impact on mortgage rates is a little less direct. But their decisions definitely influence them because folks have less money to spend on homes if they're still paying money towards their credit cards and other loans. Yeah, it makes sense. So what else uh, does determine the mortgage rates? Well, there's a lot of factors to look out here. The 10-year U.S. Treasury note, which is the most closely watched government bond, is usually an indicator of those rates. That's because they typically move together. But other factors that impact those rates include inflation, supply and demand, GDP, and the employment rate. The bottom line is mortgage rates are affected by the overall economy. Okay, now we know 2022 has been a tough year for those looking to buy a house, a low supply sending those prices through the roof. Courtney, what does the housing market look like now? We found that in July, existing home sales were down 5.9% from June and more than 20% from a year ago. But if you're looking to buy a home anytime soon, you may be in luck. According to a report from Realtor.com, home buyers are likely to find the best selection and pricing the week of September 25th to October 1st. This is because there are fewer buyers during the fall, there are more homes available, and the market is generally simmering from that summer rush. Okay, that's pretty interesting. Just keep an eye, of course, on those uh, mortgage loan rates. Make sure you can afford that payment, right? <laughs> Ladies, thank you so much. The Fact Check team is going to continue to follow developments on these and other issues. You can also read this story with links to where they found their information on our website, thenationaldesk.com. And still to come, a parent raising concerns about vape-related drug use in schools, why the district says it can't do much more to police this problem. The National Desk team of reporters bringing you the headlines from coast to coast. From the push for more police in Seattle to an increased police presence in Oregon. We're taking the pulse of America and we start with vaping dangers in schools in Alabama. 
I'm all about him being punished for what he did, but I also want to see this stuff out of our schools. Melinda Hastings says her grandson, a Robertsdale High School student, was on campus recently when another student gave him what he was told was a vape pen containing THC. My grandson had hallucinations, um, did something in class, got suspended. Um, but he is the only one that has suffered repercussions of this. Hastings says her husband went to the school to ask about the incident. Then showed them, showed my husband a vape dab pen, talking about um, it's a it's an issue, but there's basically nothing they can do. The school spokesperson says vaping is a serious issue across the country, and it's hard to police unless a student is caught with the device or another person turns them in. Hastings says the vape did not belong to her grandson, but he did not confess which teen gave him the vape pen out of fear of being called a snitch. They have cameras, that's my thing. They don't even need a student to snitch. They know what time they, they caught him. They could go back and look and say, hey, he walked in that bathroom with that student. We need to do something. As a community, as parents, we need to stand up and do something to protect our children. Definitely a step in the right direction. I am hopeful, yet I am weary at the same time. Two different women with the same mission to stop gun violence in King County and support the people impacted, all of them. We have to come at this from many different angles if we're going to achieve genuine community safety. It'll take a coordinated safety network across five departments and 75 million to fund key programs to reduce crime, gun violence, and help people experiencing mental health crises. From the jails. We're committed to bringing in 100 correctional officers. And to hire 70 more King County Sheriff's deputies. My top priority is ensuring community trust and transparency. The proposal calls for body-worn cameras for every deputy by 2025, a special unit focused on responding to gun violence. Advocating for the mothers, the caregivers, and the children who have been directly impacted by gun violence. Portland police say they want to improve pedestrian access, monitor a busy neighborhood, and build relationships with businesses here. Sometimes just the presence of police officers in the area um, can, you know, change uh, the atmosphere uh, and make it safer so folks don't feel uh, emboldened to, you know, engage in any activities that could result in violence or other uh, criminal conduct. Jimmy Heberling owns Barrel Room. He also left Old Town during the pandemic and now is coming back. We're going to slowly mold back to relying on the city to do the job that we'd love for them to do instead of us. Other business owners tell us with high demand on weekends, they're encouraged to have resources. Where else do you go to 10, 15,000 people and you don't have a police presence? We made some changes at Central Precinct. Uh, in order to accommodate the need for staffing, which is a huge issue. So that was kind of a heavy lift, but we were able to do it. And so here we are, we're gonna start it up. And still to come, the national desk going one-on-one -on -one with Kentucky Senator Rand Paul. The Republicans' thoughts on the state of the COVID pandemic, next. This week, COVID making big headlines again after President Biden said in an interview that the pandemic is over. The National Desk Jan Jeffcoat spoke with Kentucky Senator Rand Paul, who's made headlines himself in the past for his fiery exchanges with Dr. Anthony Fauci. So I want to start with COVID. You know, the president said the pandemic is over. We know COVID's not going away. At what point, Senator, do we accept that? And what does that look like for this country moving forward? Well, you know, we have four other coronaviruses that circulate amongst us and have for hundreds of years. They are uh, seen as the common cold. 
Now, I don't think this one has quite mutated to become the common cold yet, but it is becoming less dangerous over time. We also know that about 99% of Americans now have some form of immunity, either immunity from the vaccine or immunity from having had the disease. But it's important that we factor into it the immunity you get from having the disease in trying to make our decisions. So for example, 80% of school children have had the disease. And it means that we should be less anxious about them because they now have immunity. And unless we include that in our discussions about what guidelines we should give children, I don't think we're obeying or looking at the science objectively. And this has been my main complaint with Dr. Fauci is that he's ignoring the immunity that you acquire from having the disease. And as a consequence, he's pushing two, three vaccines on children for whom there are some side effects and significant side effects, particularly for teenage boys, that should be a part of the discussion before the government is you know, shoving this vaccine down your throat. And you've been calling for the removal of Dr. Fauci. Now he's gonna be stepping aside in December, but, but you still want this investigation into the country's re response for COVID as well as uh, where it came from, You know, the, the origin. You wanna hold Fauci responsible. What does holding him responsible look like? I think what's most important to me is finding out and listening to the scientists on the origin of the virus. Because if this came from a lab where we're doing gain of function or the Chinese were doing gain of function research, taking a virus and making it more infectious, making it aerosolized, making a virus more contagious, these are very risky type of uh, research projects. They're not only going on in China, we do them in the United States. So I had three scientists recently come into Washington and all three scientists say that this research should be regulated the way we, re that we regulate nuclear research. So for example, if you make centrifuges that can enrich uranium, you're not allowed to just make them and sell them to China or sell them to Iran. Um, there are controls on these things. And I think that this kind of technology, which this time around killed about 6 million people worldwide, um, what if they, release a virus into the environment that's brand new, doesn't exist, and has 50% mortality. There are scientists worried that we could destroy civilization with this kind of craziness. So there has to be an investigation and there have to be reforms such to, to try to prevent this from happening well, again. Of course, and that's the whole point is just figuring out the origin so you can prevent this from happening in the future. Why do you think there are not stronger calls to force China to, to agree to an investigation, to allow more investigators into the country? You know, I'm perplexed by it. I introduced an amendment on the Senate floor and they allowed it to go unanimously to say no more funding for the Wuhan lab, no more funding for this dangerous type of research. But then interestingly, when the bill came together, they stripped my amendment out. So I don't know whether it was Nancy Pelosi or whether it was Democrats in the Senate, but they quietly took out my amendment and my amendment would have prevented this type of research from being funded. I think it's insane that we are sending money to an authoritarian country like China that is not open, that is very secretive, and that did not do an adequate investigation of the origins of this virus, that we send them any money at all. I think it's a disgrace. And if we were in charge, if in November Republicans win, I will be able to pursue this as a chairman of a committee. I will subpoena the records. I will bring in scientists on both sides of the issue, but we will listen to the scientists, not just one individual who's consumed with himself and thinks he is the science, Dr. Fauci. We will listen to experts on both sides of this who were not part of funding the lab. Here's the problem with having Dr. Fauci involved with this. He funded the lab. So he, he has, he has a, a, a direct conflict of interest because if this came from the lab, culpability would attach to him for having been the one who funded the lab. So he can't possibly investigate himself. So we need outside investigators. You can watch more of this interview on our website, thenationaldesk.com. Still to come, January 6th investigation. Public hearings set to resume soon. What the committee's chairman is now saying about that upcoming meeting.
Back now with a look at the top trending stories on our website. A family in Utah suing Little League Baseball after their son fell out of his bunk bed at the Little League World Series and suffered head injuries. That family also suing the bed manufacturer. And police in Texas warning a new crime trend called jugging is now on the rise. Suspects are following bank customers back home and robbing them. Police say mainly women and the elderly are being targeted. Those stories are more available right now on our website, thenationaldesk.com. And a look ahead now at the big stories we'll be following for you in the coming days. Tuesday, the sentencing trial of the Parkland school shooter Nicholas Cruz is set to resume. The jury will decide whether Cruz will get the death penalty or life behind bars. Then Wednesday, the January 6th committee will hold its first hearing since, since July. Committee Chairman Benny Thompson expects it to be the panel's last public hearing. That's unless there's a significant development. And looking ahead to Friday, the Supreme Court Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson will have her investiture ceremony. She will once again take the oath to serve on the high court. Now, this is all purely ceremonial, of course. Jackson already on the job. So to come, politics and public schools, the fierce fight happening right now between lawmakers over what should and shouldn't be taught in our classrooms. You're watching The National Desk, America's News Now. You can watch us live weekdays, 6 a.m. till 11 a.m. and 10 p.m. till midnight Eastern and anytime online at thenationaldesk.com. We're back after this. The National Desk, America's News, now. Politics in public school classrooms, a look at the fight between lawmakers over what should and should not be taught. Looming legal challenges over student debt forgiveness, the possible showdown shaping up as midterm elections near, and how much funding the White House is asking Congress for to fight COVID-19, despite the president's comments saying the pandemic is over. This is the National Desk, America's News Now. I'm Eugene Ramirez. Right now, a fierce debate over what can and can't be discussed in our public schools. One hot topic, gender identity and politics playing a central part in this debate. As part of our Crisis in the Classroom series, the National Desk Chief Political Correspondent Scott Thuman has new poll numbers and reaction. Voters this November are driven to the midterms by divisive issues from the economy to crime to abortion rights, but also top of mind education, more specifically a fight over what educators can or should teach in the classroom. Education today sadly is far different than education was 20 or 30 years ago when um, sex ed was introduced um, at older ages. Now the kinds of issues and the kinds of lessons that are being pushed are at very, very young ages and often with extremely graphic and sometimes disturbing content. A recent New York Times poll shows when asked if teachers should be able to provide instruction on sexual orientation and gender identity in elementary school, an overwhelming number, 70% were opposed. Only 27 supported the idea. The progressive uh, left Democrats are trying to put politicians and bureaucrats between parents and their children. That argument helped elect Governor Glenn Youngkin in Virginia, where he has since signed bills allowing parents to see a school's curriculum. It's a parent's child, not the state, not government's child. In Florida, the governor promoted a new ban on lessons about sexual orientation and materials not deemed age appropriate for K through third graders. But to critics, it's discrimination, and they plan to fight back at the polls. In the next election, your voice will matter. Insisting the need for inclusivity has grown and must be addressed in what they see as a safe space. You're letting a kid know that it's fine 
if you, for example, think you might be gay or you are trans or whatever. Um, so it's 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 really important um, at that early age to just normalize the kind of full diversity of identities that exist. The White House weighing in in the past has called this type of ban on in-classroom discussions discriminatory, saying it's a dangerous trend. But that poll does show that it's voters across party lines who do have a broad concern about what's being taught. Eugene? And Scott, when you look at these polls and you talk about older students, those beyond elementary school, what do the numbers show then? Yeah, well, that's where you see a real shift, Eugene. In fact, there are a bit more voters who are okay with having these conversations in classrooms when you're talking about middle school students. And then when you talk about high school, you see a majority, 56%, who say they're in favor, they support this kind of conversation. Okay, Scott Thuman reporting tonight from the Capitol. Thank you. From COVID protocols to book bans, schools are a hot political battleground as we ramp up to the midterms. Florida-based conservative group Moms for Liberty wants political candidates to sign a parental pledge. Joining me now to discuss is Moms for Liberty co-founder Tina Deskovich. Welcome back to the National Desk. Thanks for having me on. Our pleasure. Explain this parental pledge uh, to us. What is it and what is your group trying to accomplish with it? It's simple. It's time for parents to take back public education. Uh, the unions have been in control of schools for decades. Uh, Tiffany and I, Tiffany Justice and I, were the co-founders of Moms for Liberty. We've served as school board members here in Florida, and we saw that power in action. And I think all of America saw the power uh, that unions had as COVID unfolded in 2020. So now is the time for parents to hold their elected leaders accountable. We're asking all elected officials at all levels of government to sign a very simple pledge saying that they understand and respect that parents have the fundamental right to direct the upbringing, education, religious and moral upbringing of their children. Now this pledge uh, in part reads to honor the fundamental rights of parents, including but not limited to the right to direct the education, medical care, and moral upbringing of their children. Now teachers and, and other people in schools are oftentimes uh, the adults who help a child navigate a personal struggle, uh, even if just by creating a, a welcoming environment. Uh, in some cases are the ones that sound the alarm when there's a sign of abuse or other trouble suspected. How do you respond to critics who say that teachers are being restrained uh, by political action under the guise of parental rights? Look, parents and teachers really do need to work together for what's best for children. And, and moms and, and teachers have been doing that for decades. No one wants to get involved in that. We are talking about policymakers, lawmakers that are purposely putting rules and policies and laws in place that interject the government uh, in between the relationship between a parent and child. We're seeing it happen here in Florida. We're seeing it happen all around the country. Well, and some we would say that they're in Florida, that the governor's doing the same thing and school board members are doing the same thing. Uh, it just depends on what side you're on. So, so uh, explain that to us. Uh, how do you uh, uh, kind of balance that out uh, and say that, you know, one side is trying to direct education when, when that side is saying the same thing about the other side? Yeah, I don't really understand that because the only thing we are trying to do is to get politics out of school. Uh, what has been pushed into school over the last decade or so is indoctrination. It's one worldview um, by one particular organization and one well, one particular group. Let, let, let me We're ask you this: to do is get that out of schools. We don't want pornography in schools. We don't want um, the teaching of racism in schools. It's it's very simple. It, it's teach the facts, teach kids to read. Kid, two thirds of American fourth graders are not reading on grade level. You, you, Why you can't we I, want, I, want to, I want to stop for a second. And take you back. You mentioned you want to take politics out of schools, but then your organization is now uh, creating this pledge to target politicians and, and to have them sign on to this. Um, and your organization also gives donations uh, to specific politicians. Uh, so wouldn't you say that that your organization is in fact uh, being part of that politicizing of, of what's happening in schools? Our organization has not given any funds to a politician, so I'm not sure where you're getting that information from. Your, your organization doesn't support uh, candidates, uh, or maybe, not, I'm sorry, maybe it's endorsements and not uh, a fund, but your organization doesn't support candidates for office? Our chapters endorse candidates in school board races. Okay, and, and thank you for clearing that up for us. Uh, when we talk about rep, uh, parents uh, having uh, the final say in what happens uh, to uh, their children in schools and what they're taught, um, how do you make sure that the parents that your organization represents uh, uh, are a you know, variety of parents and not just one homogenous group? 
We are open to all parents. We respect the right of parents to raise their children. We are a conservative leaning group. There's no doubt about that. Sure. But if you want to, if you want to defend your principles and your values and teach your children your principles and your values, you belong with us, and we will accept you. Uh, you know, people try to put us in in a in a in a box per se of who we are, and it's mm -hmm. just not true. We have we have all races in our organization. We have all sexual orientations in our organization. But mostly we are all parents and we care about our children and we want to have the autonomy to teach them the morals and values that we believe in. Okay, it'll be an interesting couple of months here to the midterms. Uh, thanks so much for explaining this all to us. Uh, Tina Deskovich with Moms for Liberty. Thank you. Thank you. Just weeks to the midterm elections and opponents of President Biden's student loan forgiveness plan are preparing to file a legal challenge. Several conservative groups and Republican officials planning to sue as soon as the administration makes a formal move, such as releasing the applications for that program. Now, they argue the plan is unconstitutional and that President Biden is acting without the proper authority. The Wall Street Journal reports the Constitution requires plaintiffs to show that they suffered injury from the administration's actions. Now, the White House today uh, releasing a state-by-state -state breakdown of the number of borrowers that will benefit from student loan forgiveness. Take a look here. California and Texas having the most borrowers meeting that criteria. They're followed by Florida, New York, and Pennsylvania. The White House says about 90% of the relief will go to Americans earning less than $75,000 per year. When it comes to hot button issues, voters split on which party they trust more. This is interesting here. A new political morning consult poll shows 44% trust Democrats more on gun control compared to 41% who trust Republicans on that issue. However, when dealing with inflation, 46% trust Republicans compared to just 36% for Democrats. And 44% believe Democrats are better suited at handling education. That compares to 39% for Republicans. President Biden getting a lot of heat for saying the pandemic is over. Our fact check team has been looking into this all night for us. Janae, are the president's words in line with the administration's actions? Well, Eugene, some lawmakers don't think so. And it's because the White House continues to ask Congress for $22 billion for the national COVID-19 response for things like COVID-19 testing and vaccines. Now, how does this change things? Is Congress expected to approve that request? Uh, it's not likely right. because there won't probably be enough Republican votes. And we dug up from this letter from Senator Richard Burr that said in part, your administration continues to request unoffset emergency funding from Congress, enforce vaccine mandates, and maintain federal emergency declarations that cost taxpayers billions of dollars. And it seems now that the White House is uh, kind of being very careful with how they frame the issue as well. Right. So today during the White House press briefing, Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre didn't repeat the president's words that the pandemic was over when asked about it. She said that COVID-19 is a lot more manageable and that the administration now knows what tools work. Now, she barked at Republicans for holding up the COVID funding and says it's important for how the country fights future pandemics. Okay, now, Courtney, whether one agrees that the pandemic is over or perhaps doesn't agree that the pandemic is over, one thing that medical experts are saying is you still need to go out there and get the booster shots, right? Right. The CDC recommends that all teens and adults get the updated COVID booster, which was designed to target the original virus and the Omicron variant. And with fall and winter months approaching, experts say don't wait. If you're 12 or older and it's been at least two months since your last vaccine or booster, you're eligible. And anyone who's older, has chronic illness, or is immunocompromised, or pregnant should get the shot as soon as possible. And the boosters may be around indefinitely is what we're learning. Health officials say that COVID could soon be treated more like the flu, meaning we would only need one shot a year. Now, the White House COVID response coordinator said that older people with health issues may need to get boosted more often. Okay, ladies, thanks so much. And the fact check team will continue to follow developments on these and other issues. You can also read the story with links to where they found their information on our website, thenationaldesk.com. Still to come, a parent dragged by a school bus now facing charges. Witnesses breaking down what led to that incident and what they think of the driver's actions. Then police officers adding a new tool to their belts, the life-saving gift from a university. Next.
The National Desk team of reporters bringing you the headlines from coast to coast. We're taking the pulse of America and we start in Virginia where residents are demanding answers after they say a school bus driver dragged a parent and ran over his leg. The way she just totally disregarded running somebody over like they were just a piece of trash on the road. I don't want her driving my kid and nobody else in Prince William County should either. Chad Mock is referring to the driver who he says ran over the leg of one of his neighbors last Tuesday. A substitute driver with Prince William County Public Schools arrived late to drop off students from Covington Harper Elementary. Parents grew frustrated then. He came flying up from my right side, grabbed the door because he, he said my daughter, I think he said something to the effect, my daughter's crying, let her off. He tried to open the doors and it looked like she had jumped. She was out of her seat. She jumped in, gunned it. His hand was still stuck on the door. So she dragged him at least 100 feet. The police report confirms the parent was struck in the lower leg by one of the bus tires and was charged with attempted trespassing and disorderly conduct. According to Virginia law, any person who without the consent of some person authorized to give such consent goes or enters upon any school property for any purpose shall be guilty of a class three misdemeanor. The statute explains school property includes a school bus. Mock's second grade daughter was on the bus. He and other parents wonder why the driver wasn't charged. In Washington, the city of Olympia plans to block all traffic this week to tow away some of the dozens of RVs parked on the side of a road leading to a hospital. Now, for years, healthcare workers have complained about the dangers of blocking that road. Ambulances have even had to swerve around people in the RVs. The RV owners have been given the option to live in tiny homes or go elsewhere. I've been down to those tiny homes and I just wasn't happy with it. I've been in prison twice and it just it reminded me of like being in medium custody prison. Now the city says it expects to have the road cleared by mid-October. And in Nevada, Toro University has partnered with Metro officers to provide them with trauma medical kits and training on how to use those. All officers will now go through four hours of training to use the kits, which attach to their belts to allow officers to provide immediate help. Officials say the kits have already been used seven times, one officer even using it on herself after being shot. He started the program for a mass casualty incident for our officers to be able to have something to be able to help right away. But we're seeing it being used day to day when officers are arriving on bad vehicle accidents, if they arrive on a shooting. This program was brought about after the Las Vegas shooting in 2017. Still ahead, our team of correspondents breaking down this week in Washington from the unsteady job market to pandemic relief fraud. Our Washington Bureau covers Capitol Hill in D.C. every day to report on the important issues facing the country and how they impact you. For some perspective on what's happening in the nation's capital, I'm joined by our national correspondent, Atra Elnishar. Atra, interest rates up, prices still high, yet unemployment still low. Normally, on the jobs front, that's ideal, but in this economy, that's not necessarily the case. Well, the thing that's really troubling here, Steve, is the labor shortage. The labor market is extremely strong when it comes to workers having choices of where they want to go and having leverage and things like wage negotiations. But the labor shortage, where there's still about two open jobs for every person looking for work, is adding to inflation. Uh, think of it as just another supply chain disruption. This time, it's a lack of humans getting in the way. So what we heard Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell say this week is that he wishes there was a pain this way to lower inflation, but there isn't. So raising interest rates another 75 basis points with more rate hikes to come too, by the way. Uh, and the Federal Reserve putting out its new projection for what it thinks the unemployment rate's going to be by the end of next year. They think it's going to be 4.4%. Uh, right now it's 3.7. So not a full point, but every little tick up is, is 
potentially hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. Uh, so the last time, you know, you know, if someone's skeptical about why should people have to lose their jobs to bring down prices, well, think of this. The last time that the United States had a 4.4% unemployment rate before COVID, we're talking about pre-pandemic when things were somewhat normal. Uh, the last time we had that unemployment rate, inflation was only 1.9%, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So it's sort of that trade-off that the Fed's having to, to go with. Uh, all of these decisions affect everyday lives lives as bureaucratic as they may seem and it really does seem like the unemployment rate's going to have to tick up uh, in order to get prices down right another, another indicator making uh, folks more nervous about the economy as we go forward uh, also this week you've been doing some reporting on pandemic relief fraud uh, the justice department really sort of cracking down uh, on uh, on the billions of dollars that have gone missing or at least been fraudulently taken from uh, pandemic relief programs tell us what you've learned well, and to give you an indication of how much work the DOJ thinks is ahead of them, this week they announced three more what's called strike forces or, or teams on the ground trying to identify and prosecute people who took advantage of these emergency programs. Now, I just spoke to um, Chair Michael Horowitz. He's the head of the uh, OIG watchdog committee. Uh, that's Basically, their job is to do that as well. This is a, a multi multiple agency effort here because so much money was given out and so much, unfortunately, was fraudulently obtained. And what he's saying here is that uh, this was, yes, an unprecedented amount of money that went out. It, it helped a lot of people, uh, but there were some really basic checks that could have been in place to prevent a lot of this fraud. For instance, when Congress wrote the statute that made these unemployment uh, benefits uh, in, the, in the early days of the pandemic a scary, scary time, they gave states the option to allow folks to self-certify basically the honor system. Now, the states didn't have to, to do that. They could have put in their own checks, but many of them just didn't. Uh, for instance, we saw in California just the estimated fraudulently obtained unemployment benefits more than $18 billion. And we're only seeing estimates estimates from less than half the states, and that's still totaling about $46 billion in lost uh, unemployment funds to fraud. So there is a lot to do, some really staggering numbers out already, uh, and it's just the tip of the iceberg. National correspondent Audra Elnishar, thank you. Eugene, thanks. back to you. Big thanks to our Capitol Hill team. Still ahead, it's been increasingly added to vehicles over the years, but a new investigation uncovers a big blind spot in technology meant to help drivers. Right now, pedestrian deaths surging across America with nearly 7,500 people struck and killed by cars last year alone. And to reverse that trend, car makers are coming out with technology that can detect a pedestrian and then apply the brakes. But Spotlight in America has uncovered a crucial flaw with this feature. Lisa Fletcher reports. It happens in an instant. A car slams into an unseen pedestrian in the dark of night. Here at the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety's testing lab in Southern Virginia, the scenario and the pedestrian are fake, but the implications are real. The automatic emergency braking systems, or AEBs, that are designed to protect you by taking control of the vehicle and stopping it before a collision don't always work. And as we discovered, are especially ineffective at night when drivers may rely on them most to avoid a pedestrian or animal in the road. It doesn't get any easier to watch, even though you know it's a dummy. Yeah, it, it's tough, and uh, it's tough when you're in the vehicle, 
David Ayler is the Institute's Vice President of Active Safety Testing, and he's designed these crash scenarios to try to better understand how these braking systems are working at night. Uh, the dummy is set, ready for your run. Spotlight on America was invited to watch as professional drivers drove straight at the dummy at designated speeds to see if the brakes would spring into action, unprompted by the driver. We watched two trucks, same manufacturer, both model year 2022, fare very differently in the tests. At its worst, plowing into the dummy and dragging it under the vehicle. At best, stopping just before impact. The difference in performance from vehicle to vehicle leaves consumers in the dark about whether these systems will actually do their job when they're needed most. We want to make sure Jessica Chicchino is the IIHS vice president of research. Should automakers be more upfront with consumers about these automatic braking devices? They work great during the day, don't work so well at night. We would like to see um, automakers improve their performance at night so that they will be working well all of the time and so consumers won't have to worry about that. The Insurance Institute for Highway Safety launched a study that found that AEB systems reduced the odds of a pedestrian crash by 32% during daylight. But in unlighted areas, the study found that systems make no difference at all in the odds of a nighttime pedestrian crash for vehicles with and without the crash avoidance technology. Pedestrian deaths have been rising really alarmingly over the last decade, and we've seen that some of the biggest increases have been in the dark, where we see that more than three quarters of pedestrian fatalities occur in the dark. So it is really important if we want to have these systems help prevent fatalities for them to work in these situations where we see the most deaths occurring. Scattered across America are reminders of what's at stake, like here in Silver Spring, Maryland, where Rachel Grossman has endured two tragedies on streets near her home. In 2016, my dad was hit crossing Georgia Avenue, and then about a year ago, my mother was hit about two blocks away from him. They both died. She believes that if AEBs are advertised as a safety feature, they have to work. And she'd like to see federal standards put in place to guarantee it. More regulation on the production of it and the manufacturing, I would say. Kind of like how all cars have to have airbags, you know? We're told that 2025 would be the earliest that such a requirement could exist, leaving consumers, for now, dangerously in the dark. For Spotlight on America, I'm Lisa Fletcher. And that's going to do it for this weekend edition of the National Desk, America's News Now. Don't forget you can watch live from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. and 10 p.m. till midnight Eastern time. Check your local listings and also online. Catch up with the latest headlines at thenationaldesk.com. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Eugene Ramirez. Have a great rest of your weekend.